All right, so we're continuing our study of the Old Testament survey. Today we're in the book of Deuteronomy, and I've mentioned this guy before. I'm going to mention him again and, and read a quote from Paul House, who's written a book called the Old Testament Theology, just on the significance of this book. You could probably make a case for every Bible book being really important, but De- Deuteronomy is certainly up there. And here's what he says. By any standard of comparison, Deuteronomy is one of the most important books in the canon. Its historical setting links the Sinai and wilderness experiences. In other words, where we are in the book of Deuteronomy, we've already experienced Sinai and God entering into the covenant with the nation of Israel there. And we've already experienced the wilderness wandering through the book of Numbers. And now we're after Deuteronomy, we'll go into Joshua and the conquest. So it links Sinai and the wilderness experiences with the conquest of Canaan and provides a transition from Moses' leadership to Joshua's. Its canonical placement concludes the Pentateuch, so that gives it some important significance, by effectively interpreting Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Yet it also provides an interpretive framework for the former and latter prophets, Joshua and Malachi. Its theological emphases set the tone for how Israel must live in the land they will inherit from the God who has chosen them. Its exhortative instructional style offers rhetorical patterning for Old Testament historians, prophets, psalmists, and sages. That's a really fancy way of saying that those later folks, like the wisdom literature writers, like the psalmists, like the former and latter prophets, draw upon what's already been stated in the book of Deuteronomy. Later revelation builds on earlier revelation. Beyond the Hebrew canon, Deuteronomy is with Genesis, Psalms, and Isaiah, one of the four most quoted Old Testament books in the New Testament. Jesus himself uses passages from Deuteronomy Deuteronomy to resist Satan's temptations in Matthew 4, 1 to 11. Unquestionably, this book, the Pentateuch's capstone, deserves careful theological analysis. So let's consider the setting of the book. It takes place over a period of about one month in the plains of Moab, which is right up here. The city is called Shittim, and it's in the 40th year after God delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage. So let's review, starting up in Goshen, really with the end of Genesis, uh, Joseph and his brothers are down in Egypt. Uh, They end up being delivered from Egyptian bondage through the plagues, which are tremendous demonstrations of God's power and a refutation of the gods of Egypt. After Pharaoh had let them go, you remember he changed his mind and wanted to come after them. So they're kind of pinned against the Red Sea and God delivers them from the Egyptian army, destroys the Egyptian army by drying up the sea and allowing the Israelites to walk through and then destroying the Egyptian army afterward. As we've already heard this morning, uh, reminded of the fact that God provided for them supernaturally in the wilderness with manna and water in a very difficult land. Just not a lot of low-hanging fruit to eat as you walk through this particular part of uh, the land. They also got provided victory over the Amalekites. They make their way down to uh, the victory over the Amalekites was at Rephidim, as was the provision of water. They make their way down to Sinai. And here's where they enter into covenant with God. They're here for a little over 11 months. They are also provided instru- well, instruction first for building the tabernacle, which will be the place that they worship and the place that God dwells. And they're provided instruction on the various offerings in the book of Leviticus that they're to bring for all kinds of things, really. Certainly for atonement for sin, but also thank offerings. And just that's the system of worship that God had designed for them. After they're given that instruction, they finally uh, are ready to depart Sinai. And the book of Numbers records the way that they are to gather around the tabernacle each time that they set out from camp. They make their way up to Kadesh Barnea. And in the book of Numbers, we looked at this last week, uh, there's recorded the significant instances of rebellion that take place over this period. There's complaints just three days out of the rigors of travel. Moses complains about the burden that this uh, leading these two 
two to two and a half million people is on him. So God allows him to appoint 70 elders to help with that. <clears throat> the people complain about having only manna to eat. God provides quail that <clears throat> even then they are very greedy in the way that they're eating and lack of thankfulness. And God disciplines them in the midst of that. There's the rebellion of Aaron and Mir Miriam that takes place. So it's not a very pretty picture in the book of Numbers. They finally do make it up to Kadesh Barnea, which is right here. And what happens there? They send the spies into the land. They send the spies straight up into the land. Twelve spies, one from each of the twelve tribes. They come back and say, yep, the land is everything that you said it was going to be. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. But well, there's no way that we can take it. Exactly. It's filled with giants and fortified cities. And how are we going to do this? And we're ready to go back to Egypt. At least 10 of the 12 spies said that, Joshua and Caleb being the exceptions. Um, so that was the straw that broke the camel's back as far as that generation being able to enter the promised land. And things don't get better after that. There's the revolt of Korah, Dathan, and Abraham, along with 250 other leaders that were men of renown. Miriam eventually dies. He was one of the last to die of the generation that came out of Egypt. Even Moses, uh, frustrated with the people, strikes the rock instead of speaking to it the way that the Lord commanded him. And that cost him entrance into the promised land. Aaron dies. And they, over a period of time, wander in the wilderness for some 37 and a half years. But finally... They send messengers over to Punan to ask the king of Edom if they can go straight up the king's highway into the promised land. He denies that to them. They have to go south to get north, and they skirt around. They have some victories again over Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan. They finally make it up here to the plains of Moab. Remember also we had uh, Balaam, who... I'm sorry, Balak, who was king of Moab, who heard about this great horde that was moving through, and he hired Balaam to curse the people of Israel. Three times he asked that they be cursed, and three times Balaam blessed them instead. So now that sets the stage for where we are in, the Deuteron in Deuteronomy. What is the great need that's met in the book of Deuteronomy? What does Moses need to do? He knows he's not going to get to go into the promised land, what is he doing in Deuteronomy? Restating the, the, the law, the covenant. He's restating the law and the covenant. And why does he need to do that? It's a new generation. It's a new generation. The ones that heard it at Sinai have all died. So this is a new generation that needs this exhortation, needs to understand what their obligations are to Yahweh, and they need to understand all that he's done for them. So there's a need for them to to have the law given to them again, in a sense. So here's a very basic outline of the book. Moses reviews Israel's journey from Sinai to the plains of Moab, which we just kind of did on the map. Moses reviews and expounds the law for this new generation. That takes up the biggest chunk of the book from chapters 5 to 26. Then Moses reviews Israel's covenant relationship with God in 27 through 30. What What's going on in 27 through 30 in particular? What's the biggest chunk of that? And I'm thinking especially 28. Is it the blessings and curses? It is. It's the promise of blessings for covenant obedience and curses for covenant disobedience. And then 31 to 10 is a really significant passage in Deuteronomy because after anticipating, and it becomes... I think it becomes really clear before they ever enter the land that things are not going to work out well. And they're going to experience the curses rather than the blessings. But 31 through 10 says, despite that, and despite the fact that they have the ultimate curse of being cast out of the land, that God will not forsake them, that he will restore them as the people and bring them back and circumcise their hearts. And ultimately, they will be obedient to the covenant. And then finally, the final ministry of Moses in chapters 31 through 34. He teaches Israel this song that we read earlier in chapter 32. 
again, that's not a very optimistic song as to what's going to happen, but very accurate as to what actually plays out in the rest of the Old Testament. And then he also, Moses dies. He dies and God buries him himself uh, in Mount Nebo. Just looking at that basic outline, uh, what's common to all four sections? Moses. Moses. Moses is the leader and has been the leader, you know, since early on in Exodus. And now he's passing off the scene. We've already seen that Joshua is commissioned to take his place. But uh, Moses is just an incredible figure in the history of Israel and an incredible relationship that he had with Yahweh. So another way that we can look at the book of Deuteronomy, and one that we've talked about before in our class on the covenants, is to see it as a covenant, a covenant document. It's a suzerain vassal treaty document. And when we talk about a suzerain vassal, we're talking about a relationship where a king conquers a people, and they enter into this relationship where the king has certain responsibilities, and those are spelled out. But the vassal, the people that are conquered, has certain responsibilities as well, and Deuteronomy fits this pattern. So we've done this recently in the covenants that we walked through, but I want to review it again just to, as a way of understanding the book of Deuteronomy. First, we have the preamble that sets out the occasion and setting of the covenant. It's just five verses, so I'll read these. These are the very opening words of the book of Deuteronomy. And again, you can see how Deuteronomy is really kind of gathering up everything that they've experienced up to this point in their history and preparing them to move forward into the land. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness in the Arabah, opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and Disahab. It is 11 days journey from Horab, other name from Sinai, by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Came about in the 40th year, that is the 40th year, starting at the point at which they left Egypt. On the first day of the 11th month, that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had commanded him to give to them. After he had defeated Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and lived in Heshbon, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth and Adre. Across the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to expound this law. So that again, that's just setting the scene and describing what Moses is about to do. Next, we have the historical prologue that runs from 1.6 to 449. And this narrates Israel's journey from Sinai to the plains of Moab. Again, especially noting the instances of Israel's rebellion. We just covered that last week in the book of Numbers, but Moses reviews it again for this new generation and also God's righteous retribution. Remember, they would rebel and they would pay the price. God would discipline them for their rebellion. The purpose of this section is to make clear God's claim on his people despite their disobedience. God had not forsaken them and had brought them to the present time and place in order that he might reaffirm his covenant with them. We're not going to read any out of this section. But as you can imagine, it's really reviewing and summarizing what took place in the book of Numbers. Then we have what we call the general stipulations that run from 5.1 to 11.32. Now this includes the Ten Commandments that are spelled out in Exodus 20. It's more than that too. It spells out the principles that govern the relationship between the parties of the covenant and clarifies who the great king is, that is Yahweh, what he has already done. He's constantly reminding the nation of what he's already done in bringing them out of Egyptian bondage and providing for them in the wilderness and really showing his grace and mercy towards them despite their rebellion against him and how the people are to respond. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 is especially significant. That, of course, is the Shema. But the Ten Commandments are also part of this section. Um, you're familiar with those, but <clears throat> let me just read some of these to refresh our memories. Deuteronomy 5, beginning at verse 6, Yahweh says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol 
or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Now remember, they come out of a land in Egypt where, where all kinds of idol worship. So they knew what that was about. They're about to go into a land. This is the same way. And they're supposed to do away with all that idol worship and stay faithful to the one who has redeemed them. You should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Observe the Sabbath to keep it holy. That's the sign, as we saw, saw of the Mosaic Covenant. Honor your father and mother. You should not commit murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not bear false witness against your neighbor. You should not covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's house, his field, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, anything that belongs to your neighbor. Those are the general principles of the law and of the covenant that God has with his people. And we're going to go on and see how the more specific stipulations flesh out these general principles. The Shema is, uh, starts in verse 4 of chapter 6. It really summarizes the essence of the relationship and the responsibility of the people. It also talks about the responsibility to teach each successive generation so that the continuity is not lost. There's no break in the successive generations understanding what the responsibilities toward the Lord were. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one, only one God, no idols. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. In other words, they were to constantly be in the word of God, to constantly remind themselves of what their responsibilities were. They had to know it to be able to obey it. And that's just an extreme part, important uh, responsibility that they had. All right, then we move to the specific stipulations that run from 12.1 to 26.15. These are what's often called case law, and it's an application of the general principles to different situations in life. They're grounded in the Shema and in the commandments of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And I just want to give you one example of how this worked. We already read that there was to be no other God besides their God, the true God. That was the general stipulation. Here's how the specific stipulation spells that out in more detail in chapter 12, verses 2 through 4. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and burn their esherim with fire. And you shall cut down the engraved images of their gods, and you shall obliterate their names from that place. You shall not act like this toward the Lord your God. And there's that same kind of thing that happens with the other commandments. It's spelled out in more detail in each case how those commandments were to function. Now we have the blessings and curses spelled out in 27 1 through 28 68. Again, these are promises of blessing for obedience and curses for disobedience or covenant disloyalty. Uh, we've already looked at Leviticus 26 a number of times, but it parallels that chapter. You've got the same thing going on there. They will be blessed by God and think about the ways that they'll be blessed. Agriculturally, their flocks and herds would reproduce. They themselves would be abundant in reproduction. Uh, God would provide rains for the crops, and the crops would be abundant. All these things would, would make for a really good life for them. All they had to do was be obedient. At the same time, if they were disobedient, the very opposite kinds of things would happen. They would be in fear of the other nations. They would be in danger of wild beasts. The sky would be shut up and not provide rain, and the crops would not flourish. So all that is set out before them, in 27 through 28. <clears throat> One thing that was important when you entered into a covenant relationship like this and part of the covenant treaty were witnesses. Now, 
strictly speaking, God didn't need a witness, right? His own word is enough to guarantee that what he says is, is what he's going to do. So in this case, he doesn't call on another person as a witness. He calls upon heaven and earth as witnesses between him and his people. This is in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Now, there's two other key events to close out the book. One is Deuteronomy 32. It's the song that we read this morning, which really does anticipate the failure of the nation. The second is the death and burial of Moses in Deuteronomy 34. Let's look at that. Deuteronomy 34, beginning in verse 1. And again, just think about Moses. Think about all that he's done, all that he's been through, uh, how the Lord used the first 40 years of his life to train him in all the learning of the Egyptians, how he used the next 40 years really as a shepherd out in the wilderness to train him, to prepare him, to lead his uh, people, the nation of Israel, out of Egyptian bondage. He was 80 years old at the point at which he stood before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And then how he used him in the last 40 years to accomplish all that he had prepared him for. Now Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan. Moses wasn't going to be able to enter the promised land, but he got to see it. And all Naphtali in the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain in the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you should not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he, that is Yahweh himself, buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no man knows his burial place to this day. Although Moses was 120 years old when he died, his eye was not dim, nor his vigor abated. So the sons of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days, then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses came to an end. <clears throat> so let's just summarize. If Deuteronomy is a covenant document, let's summarize the essence of that covenant. It's a renewal of the Mosaic covenant. It's largely the same thing that they did at Sinai. The situation's going to be a little bit different because they're not going to be wandering in the wilderness now. They're going to be actually entering the land. But it is a renewal of that covenant with a new generation. <clears throat> it spells out who Yahweh is, what he's already done for his people, and what he requires of his people going forward. It promises blessing for covenant obedience and curses for disobedience, with the ultimate curse being exile from the land. And it promises that despite their disobedience, despite all their rebellion, and despite their being taken out of the land, God would not forsake his people. He would restore them from exile when they repented, and he would ultimately circumcise their hearts. Of course, the prophets pick up on that. Virtually every latter prophet has, in addition to rebuke for their sin, a promise of future restoration. And we're still looking for that future restoration of Israel today. So having gone over that in a very high fashion, what are the major themes of the book of Deuteronomy? Moses is a major thing, right? I mean, he's the guy that wrote the book. And he's the one that's expounding the law. What else? The reiteration of the Ten Commandments. The reiteration of the Ten Commandments and the whole law to go with it. Really, the reiteration of the Mosaic Covenant. A lot of review in the book of Deuteronomy. Not just of what took place at Sinai, but all of their journey up to that point. 
Anything else come to mind? Um, also, the the revision of who God is and what He expects of them. Exactly, that's an important part of the covenant. Just reminding the people who God is, what He's done, what He expects of His people, <clears throat> and what the <clears throat> excuse me, what the uh, the results or the consequences are for obedience on the one hand, or disobedience on the other. So, review of events, covenant relationship, the character of Yahweh. Again. Every Old Testament book reveals that to some degree. Uh, what are some of his character qualities, especially that are that stand out in the Book of Deuteronomy? Holiness. Holiness. Faithfulness. Faithfulness to his word and to his covenant. Loving kindness. Loving kindness. Long suffering. <coughs> mercies, but also righteous wrath. Right. I mean, at least in the parts where he's reviewing all that he's done. And even in the song that he teaches, that Moses teaches to the people of Israel, um, he talks about how he's going to discipline them in that as well. He is the only true God. He will not have any rivals. He is both near in the sense of dwelling among the people, but transcendent in the sense of, you know, you can't just come up to him and talk to him. You've got a prescribed procedure for coming in and making offerings. You go through the priests. He's faithful. He's loving. He's gracious. I mean, he chose Israel when they were nobody. And he's the one that's done everything for them and multiplied them. He's also a God of judgment, righteous judgment. Requirements for Israel we talked about to fear and love Yahweh, to keep his commandments. It will be blessing for obedience and punishment for disobedience. And again, possession of the land, we will get into that as we get into the book of Joshua, not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. But certainly it's anticipated in the book of Deuteronomy. They're right on the brink of entering into the promised land. So this, ah, the end of Moses' leadership. We talked about how important Moses was. Joshua is going to be... Uh, really important leader as well he was extremely well suited for his task which was basically to to run the Canaanites out of Canaan uh, he's a very good military leader and we'll see the way that he approached that campaign when we get to the book of Joshua so <clears throat> summarizing all this in a single purpose statement from the book of Deuteronomy Moses exhorted Israel to be faithful to the covenant God made with her at Sinai. Let me read that again. I didn't put that inflection just right. Moses exhorted Israel to be faithful to the covenant which God made with her at Sinai so that she might go in and possess the land. So we talked about the significance and importance of Deuteronomy in the canon. Uh, the remainder of the Old Testament is really an outworking of what's anticipated in the book of Deuteronomy, especially in those latter chapters. The book of Joshua records the initial conquest of the land. What Joshua and the folks that he led did was break the major resistance in the land. What we'll see when we get to the book of Joshua, he cut the country in two. He went straight across about halfway through. Then he swept down through the south in a southern campaign, and then back up through the north. Now, he didn't conquer every single individual that was out there, but he broke all the major resistance, and then each one of the tribes was responsible to go into their particular allotments and finish the job, a task which most of them failed to do, and it ends up <clears throat> costing them. As time passes, Israel's influence towards idol worship and other covenant violations by those that were left in the land and that Israel had failed to drive out and God punishes her and eventually takes her out of the land just as he said he would. All this is anticipated, again, even as early as Leviticus 26, but certainly again in Deuteronomy 28 and 30. But even as Israel and Judah are taken into captivity, God assures them through the prophets that they'll eventually be restored again in accordance with the promise of the Deuteronomy covenant in Deuteronomy 31 through 10. All right, we have one interpretive issue that we want to address. And I want to address this especially because 
Benware sees, and, and others too, not just Benware, but we're using Benware. He sees a separate Palestinian covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 29. And the reason he sees that is in Deuteronomy 29 verse 1, which is actually the end of Deuteronomy 28 in the Hebrew Bible, and which is more appropriately placed at the end of 28. But here's what 29.1 says. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the sons of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he had made with them at Horeb. What he and others, how they take this verse is that he's introducing a new covenant in chapter 29 that's separate from the one that he's just made with them at Moab. That's not what's going on. 29.1, or the end of 28 in the Hebrew Bible, is actually the close of what Moses has just gone over in the Deuteronomic Covenant. There is no separate Palestinian covenant. It's also called, sometimes called a land covenant. And the reason I would make that argument is you can see the correspondence between what we read in Deuteronomy 1.1 these are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel. That's the very opening words of the book. And then in Deuteronomy 29, 1, these are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make. It's closing off at that point uh, what was introduced in 1, 1. So 28, 6, 9 in the Hebrew text, 29, 1 in the English Bible concludes what has come before rather than introducing something new to follow. Besides, makes a distinction between what they're doing in the plains of Moab and what was done back at Sinai with the first generation. There is no covenant legislation in chapter 29, and the covenants that are referenced in 29 are the Deuteronomic covenant itself, which is a renewal of the Mosaic covenant, and the Mosaic covenant. Let's read these verses to make that clear. So, let's Deuteronomy 29, beginning in verse 9. So keep the words of this covenant to do them. And again, he's talking present tense, what he's just spelled out. That you may prosper in all that you do. You stand today, all of you, before the Lord your God, your chiefs, your tribes, your elders, and your officers, even all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the alien who is within your camps, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into the covenant with the Lord your God. Present generation and into his oath which the Lord your God is making with you today in order that he may establish you today as his people and that he may be your God just as he spoke to you and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now not with you alone am I making this covenant and this oath, but both with those who stand there with us today in the presence of the Lord our God and with those who are not with us here today. Now you could take that a couple of different ways. I think the best way to understand that is future generations. Uh, he's not only entering the covenant with this group that he's speaking to, but with their descendants as well. And then we have in 29, 25, then men shall say, because they forsook the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. That's a reference back to the covenant that was originally made at Sinai. And a reference to the generation that did forsake that covenant. There's also no later reference to a Palestinian covenant anywhere later in the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> most of the major covenants have references to them later on. I just, I don't think there's a strong case at all for there being a distinct Palestinian covenant in Deuteronomy 29 or, or a separate land covenant. I just wanted to kind of warn you of that because Ben Ware does see it that way. All right, so we won't meet for second hour next week. In two weeks, we'll look at the book of Joshua. So you'll have a little bit longer to skim through Joshua. It, it, it's, Joshua's what, 24 chapters? And <clears throat> just to get the general feel of that book, it's not divide and conquer in Joshua. It's conquer and divide. So the first 12 chapters are all about how they go through and, and break the uh, resistance. And then the last 12 are about 
how the land is divided up amongst the various tribes. That's an easy way to remember the book of Joshua. So uh, try to do that before two weeks from today. Any questions about anything that we've covered this morning? <clears throat> Finish up a little quicker, would you? Deuteronomy is something we've already talked about a lot uh, in our biblical covenants class. Kathleen. Well, I'm kind of dumb, but can you really stand on the top of Pisgah and see all of Israel? <laughs> or is that something God just did for him? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, I think you could see it. Uh, they list off all these places. Yeah. I think you could, you could see probably all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. But you wouldn't see it clearly, obviously. There could be a supernatural aspect to the way that God opened Moses' eyes to see those things in a greater d- detail. I don't think the text is really clear about that. But I think the main point is, from that vantage point, he was able to see, in a broad way, all the land that they were about to enter. That, the land that was actually mentioned? Yes. Portions of the land? Yep. Really, on both east and west sides of the Jordan. Let's have a word of prayer. I'll include returning thanks for the food. And once everything's set up in there, we can we can eat together. Father, it's been a good day for us to be here uh, to worship together among your people. Uh, we thank you f- that you are our good shepherd. Um, a, a better shepherd than we can even fully appreciate and realize. We thank you for the way that you guide us, the way that you first guided Israel, and the way that you now shepherd us in the church as well. We thank you for the way that you're working out your plan through time. Uh, We we see so much of your character as we go through the Old Testament together, as we look at the book of Deuteronomy, we we see your mighty deeds, we see your loving kindnesses, We see the fact that you don't give up on your people despite their sin and their rebellion. And we see that your purposes will not be thwarted. So we thank you for all these things. And I just pray that they would be uh, in our minds as we live day to day for you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have first to have (coughs) to share a meal together. Thank you for the food that you provided and for for folks that have worked to prepare it for us. We pray that you'd bless that food and use it to nourish us for today. We also thank you for the opportunity that we'll have to witness these baptisms of David and Christian Matthew. Just thank you for their willingness to make their professions public, to identify with this body. And Lord, we pray that you would bless them. I know that you've already helped get them established on their path to glory. I pray that you just help them from this point forward, especially as they make their professions public, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ and continue to mature in Him. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.